Well, good morning. Good morning. Um, it's good to see you. It's always good to get an opportunity to share with this group. And Dave said last week, he said, you know, it turns out I'm not going to be out of town. And I said, eh, take a break. I'll be glad to help. <laughs> and uh, so I'm, I'm glad to be able to be here with you. You know, the um, last few weeks we've been learning what it means to be chocolate milk. Um, to have our lives stirred by the Holy Spirit and stirred up by the Holy Spirit. And, and one of the things that I'm familiar with is that if you make chocolate milk with like that good Hershey's and you let it set in the refrigerator for a day or two, that chocolate all settles to the bottom. And, and so the first time I heard Dave share that illustration, it made sense you know, the uh, admonition in Scripture to uh, you know, let the Holy Spirit stir up the faith that's within us every day so that we stay chocolatey. And I wanted to take a few minutes today and talk about what's really important, at least according to Jesus. If you've got your Bibles, turn them to Matthew chapter 22 or on your uh, electronic uh, Bibles in Matthew chapter 22, starting in verse 34, and I'll read. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. There was a preacher some years ago who was preaching a sermon. And he, he, as part of his sermon, he said, there are 465 sins that you can commit that would offend God. And he said that the next week, his phone at office and at home rang off the hook, people wanting that list. <laughs> and it's, it's funny, the truth is, it would be easier, wouldn't it, if we had a, just a nice, neat little checklist and we can just check the box and say, okay, I did this and I did that, and um, okay, we'll just skip that one. And I mean, it's kind of what we would like, but it seems that it's not quite that simple. I don't even know if simple is the right term because a checklist is what the Jews had and it didn't seem to work very well for them according to Jesus. I know that currently uh, there are about 613 laws that the Jewish people are expected to obey. Or back then in Jesus' day there was a bunch, 613 I think. I think there were 603 and then the Ten Commandments. Um, one of the things that happened was the law was so important because, you know, where did the Israelites get it? The Ten Commandments, they got directly from the finger of God as he etched it into stone. And in their opinion, in their minds, this is the Big Ten. You would find these in Exodus chapter 20. And as if you read those, you'll notice, and I'm going to read them real quick. You shall have no other gods before me. Number one. Number two, you shall have not make any idols. Three, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Four, keep the Sabbath day holy. Five, honor your mother and father. Six, you shall not murder. Seven, you shall not commit adultery. Eight, you shall not steal. Nine, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And ten, you shall not covet. Now the interesting thing about this is they never wanted to break one of these. So they built a hedge around the law. That's what all these other laws were about. So, so that you wouldn't break the Sabbath or violate the Sabbath, they decided to decide whatever was considered work. And so they uh, listed it out. Uh, what is work? Well, you can get up and you can walk, but you can't work. You can't work in the field. You can't cook because that would be working. So what they would do is they would cook the Friday before enough to carry them through Saturday night. And all of these extra rules that they put on the people so that 
certainly would never get close to the kernel of the law. And the prophets also had a lot to say, but it all boils down to this. If you notice, the first four of these commandments were all about how we related to God. And then the last six were all about how we relate to one another. What had happened then is as they felt like they had all these rules and regulations that they were avoiding breaking the laws, violating the Ten Commandments, they had made the Ten Commandments or the law an idol or a god before them. So they, maybe without knowing it, had already broken two of them and made the law itself an idol. Jesus wasn't real big on this. And you'll, you know, you know, you'll read in here that uh, many times uh, he got on to people. Who was it that he got on to? Pharisees. And they were really what? Well, they were hypocrites and they were really religious people, weren't they? Yeah. It's funny. I mean, he'd have dinner with sinners and tax collectors and the dregs of society. And he would smack around the religious preachers and priests and things. Isn't that interesting? So, what he wanted them to understand was there's a lot more to knowing God than keeping a bunch of rules. So they asked Jesus, well, here's a little bit of a paraphrase of how he kind of smacked around the Pharisees. And he says, you insist that the people keep all these laws and you put them under a burden of rule keeping and yet you don't pay attention to them yourselves. So they asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? It was kind of a trick question. They, they kept trying to trip Jesus up, but he was way too clever for them. And he said, love God, love others. That's it. Do that and you'll be okay. Now that sounds very simple, doesn't it? I mean, shouldn't be that hard to do. Um, but unfortunately, at least in my case, it takes a lifetime to figure out that it's not a simple thing. Um, so, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. It's so rich in its simplicity and so hard in its execution. And Dave, Pastor Dave was talking over the last few weeks about the fruits of the Spirit. This is what your life looks like if you're a stirred up cup of chocolate milk. Love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. And I don't know about you, but I, I learned quite a few things in the process of this little series. And one of the things was uh, that when we get too uh, full of other stuff, and there's not enough margin to experience the peace of God or the joy of the Spirit or the love that we're supposed to be receiving and giving. When we get too clogged up with other things, there's no room for those fruits to come out. When we lived in Tennessee, we had fruit trees in our backyard. And we had uh, grapes. Which, incidentally, if you ever have grapes and you fertilize the ground, you'll kill them. <laughs> they, they, re they really like yucky dirt. I mean, they do really good in that. But uh, I fertilized it. We, the first year we had great big grapes, and the next seven years, nothing much grew on it. So I, I decided that I better look up or ask somebody who knew what they were doing before I touched any of our other fruit trees. Because we had plums back there. We had... Uh, apples and peaches and the peach trees and we had a couple of volunteer peach trees you know they just sort of showed up and they had these big beautiful peaches on them and and so what would happen every year almost if we didn't get them at just the right time the 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 hornets the bees and the wasps would come and they would sting our fruit and kill it and I thought oh my goodness that's terrible um, because you know, we had all this great fruit, and then all it would do is just fall down to the ground and rot. And it was no longer good fruit, it was bad fruit. It was yucky, and we couldn't even, well, we couldn't do anything with it. So, if we don't have 
enough margin in our lives. In that case, there was, <laughs> it was just a lack of knowledge about what can you do to keep the bees from stinging your peaches. I'll bet there's a sermon in there somewhere, Dave. I don't know, but <clears throat> that'd be a good sermon title anyway. <laughs> but uh, so I didn't have the knowledge for that. And I mean, we get, we get a few off of there and, and that was OK. But I have a feeling that what God wants is not just a, a couple of rescue pieces of fruit in our life. Uh, as the fruit of the spirit, but he wants us to flourish. He wants, he wants us to be full and in bloom. And, and I'll admit, sometimes we get a little busy. It gets a little crazy. And I realized just, you know, this morning as I was sitting and just, you know, praying and, uh, that this week has been one of those for me, no margin in this week at all. Cause this is, a, has been our tech week for the show. So I've gone to work each day. I get home grab a quick nap, then it's off to rehearsal, and we're at rehearsal from 6.30 until 11.30 at night. Then it's back home, they get up at 4.40 in the morning and start over again. And I realized yesterday, dang, I'm kind of tired <laughs> this week. And I got home last night, and every joint in my body hurt. <laughs> and I couldn't figure out exactly why, because we were standing up for so many hours, and, and um, you know, we had to wear these jazz shoes. <laughs> They're like black leather slippers, you know, basically is what it is, guys. It's just really a manly thing to have to. <laughs> so, <laughs> but there's no support in them at all. I mean, they're just useful for that one purpose and to stand in them for four or five hours is really uh, not a pleasant experience. But building in some margin, making sure that we have time, that we can let God stir us so that the fruit is evident in our lives is a real important thing. That was, a, that was valuable to me uh, as he shared that with us. And so as I was looking and thinking about this message and I came, you know, reading this passage and I, I want to read it in the message translation. Um, and he puts it this way. Love the Lord your God with all your passion and prayer and intelligence. It's not about rule keeping, towing the line or wearing the right hairdo, clothing or jewelry. It's about letting the first thing you think about when you rise be Jesus. It's about letting the last thing be Jesus. And it's about everything in between those moments in our day be Jesus about Jesus. Do I love God more than my wife and kids, my job, my freedom, my home, my... Really? See, this is the hard part of God's command, giving God my all. It is so hard. You know, sometimes I get it right, and it feels right, and it feels good, and then sometimes I blow it so colossally that I desperately need God's grace and also, I need others' grace. How many of you have ever been on the receiving end of grace from another human being? Does that feel pretty magnificent? And it is ten times better when we really get a hold of the fact that that all starts with God. It's His grace. And so my thinking, my thoughts, my daily actions, the focus when I love God is on Him. I love God. And as I do that, as I experience his love flowing into me and, and filling me up, filling all of that margin with him, it overflows and it spills out. And consequently, I'll love my neighbor as I love myself. Because you know what? And people say, well, you know, you love God, you love, you love your neighbors, you love yourself. Well, that's kind of selfish, but... You know, if you love God enough and realize what he thinks about you, which incidentally, if you didn't know that God is crazy head over heels in love with you, that's a fact. Nothing can change that. You don't believe me, read Romans 8. Nothing in all of creation can separate you from the love of God, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Nothing. Did you hear that? Nothing. Not actions or people or principalities or demons or angels. Nothing that you can do can separate you from the love of God. My grandfather was a Baptist preacher. He used to 
um, preach that you could fall from grace. Now that's a very popular doctrine in, 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 in some churches. And he was a uh, young, I mean, he was a, a hellfire and brimstone preacher. And he used to preach that. And uh, one, one day, a couple of the deacons got together and, and they had tears in their eyes and said, Brother Bill, uh, and they asked him about that. And they asked him, Pastor, what do you think you did to save yourself? And my granddad thought about it. He said, I couldn't do anything. It had to be God. And what do you suppose you can do to lose that? If it was all about God to begin with, why does it suddenly become about you? Yeah. Rocked his world. Changed his life completely. Yeah. And he described it to me one time. This is chapstick, but just pretend it's me. Um, <laughs> the Bible says that I am buried with Christ in God and sealed by the Holy Spirit and a promise. Now you tell me what can get you out of there. That's a lot box folks forever. And that's what Romans tells us. Neither death or principies or powers or things of this world, the world to come can separate me from the love of God, which is mine in Christ Jesus. But what if I don't think right about somebody? Nothing. But what if I don't do right. Nothing. It's a journey. It's a journey because the journey takes a while, right? And God gives us an entire lifetime. This is like our dress rehearsal for heaven. And our dress rehearsal that we had Friday night, it went okay, but it sure didn't go well. There were all kinds of things that happened in the middle of that changing sets, crashing into things, stuff falling down, people getting bonked in the head with a big old heavy bench, blood pouring. Out. This was our final dress rehearsal. Now, you know, in theater parlance, if you have a bad dress rehearsal, you should have a good opening. And we, we had a good opening. Nobody lost any limbs, toes, or anything like that. And, uh, and it went well last night. But we are living, our journey is this dress rehearsal. And, and sometimes it goes well, and sometimes it doesn't go well. But the one thing that never changes is the main event, which is God. And he never changes. He doesn't love us because we are good. Uh, I know some of y'all. Some of y'all know me. <laughs> And he doesn't love us more if we're better or less if we're worse. He loves us. His love is absolute. It is unconditional. And as I get to experience that, it fills me up. And then I'm able to love my neighbors. I love myself. Just then, a religion scholar stood up with a question to test Jesus. Teacher, what do I need to do to get eternal life? And he answered, what is written in God's law? How do you interpret it? And he said that you love the Lord your God with all your passion and prayer and muscle and intelligence and that you love your neighbor as well as you do yourself. Good answer, said Jesus. <clears throat> do it and you'll live. Looking for a loophole. Anyone ever done that? And just how would you define your neighbor? And so Jesus answered by telling a story. I love this story. There was once a man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, and on the way he was attacked by robbers. They took his clothes, beat him up, and went off, leaving him half dead. Luckily, a priest was on his way down the same road. But when he saw him, he angled across to the other side of the road. Then a Levite religious man showed up, and he also avoided the injured man. The people you would think should help. A Samaritan, completely different race. Actually, they didn't get along very well as a rule. Traveling the road came on him, and when he saw the man's condition, his heart went out to him. He gave him first aid, disinfecting and bandaging his wounds. Then he lifted him onto his donkey. 
led him to an inn, made him comfortable, and in the morning he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take good care of him. If it costs any more, put it on my bill and I'll pay you on my way back. What do you think? Jesus said, which of these three became a neighbor to the man attacked by the robbers? The one who treated him kindly, the religious scholar said. And then Jesus said, go and do the same thing. Is that classic Jesus or what? He makes it sound so matter of fact. This is it. You have the law, you have the prophets. It's all about God and others. It's all about you love God with all you've got. You love others as you love it. You'll get it then. But if the focus becomes something else, you're going to miss it. If it becomes on keeping a bunch of rules, you're going to miss it. Because you're going to miss the relationship that God created us to be in. Love God. Love your neighbor. It's... One of my goals is to live my life as if Jesus were in my skin. Uh, and I guess that's a good way to, to look at it, because he loved God, obviously, and he loved everybody he came in contact with. He even loved these religious hypocrites, although he smacked them around a little bit, but he didn't love, you know. Um, anyone ever been deep sea diving? I mean, like, you, well, you know what it is. I, I doubt if many of us have been deep sea diving. We have to wear the hard hat and the big suit. And you have to have your oxygen pumped in from the boat on top. And that oxygen is really important while you're 200 feet down or 100, however deep they go. Um, because if that compressor up top side stops, it has to be pumped in because you're under too much pressure. Then what happens to you, the diver? You, you get a little anxious down there, right? Because there's a thing that's not happening that you really would like. Or, or, or if one of the deck hands happens to step on the hose and unknowingly <laughs> pinches off your air, you know, you're going to start tugging or flailing or whatever. You're in this big heavy seat. You can't swim. to the top. That's, that's kind of how it should be with our relationship with God, that he is our, the very air that we breathe. And anything that gets in the way of crimps that hose we want to get rid of it. And that way, as we are able to breathe in God, we exhale God. And it's just, it flows in and it flows out. We can experience his love and we can let that love go out. Let God be the very air that we breathe. So, loving God I get. Who's my neighbor? According to Jesus, it's, well, everybody. So we're supposed to love everybody. Hmm. I'll be honest with you. That's really hard sometimes. <laughs> How many of y'all have Facebook? <laughs> Three. Oh, well, good. Okay. I thought it was a little more popular than that. <clears throat> um, one of the things I've noticed, I don't, I don't comment about political things on Facebook uh, because it's so annoying. Um, in, in fact, I very rarely make too many comments on Facebook anymore because when I have, it's caused controversy and headache and heartache. And so I just read most of the time, read the feeds. And I've got some people that are in my friend list uh, that you know have, have decided that it's more important for them to express their opinion about how horrible one group is and how wonderful another group is. And, and that, to me, it's a little bit annoying. Um, and so, well, usually I just hide their comments. I don't want to unfriend them because that just doesn't seem like Jesus would do that. <laughs> You're no longer my friend. <laughs> but I don't want that on my feed either because it's not who I want to be known as, you know. So... It's kind of the thing, there are some folks out there that are really annoying and hard to love. And Jesus says you don't really get an option about that, though. you got to love everyone. So, in order to do that, it's not about you. It has to be something that he does in you. And it's, it's like if Jesus isn't 
the driving force, if his, the spirit flowing and the fruits coming out aren't the driving force in my life, I'm not going to have enough margin to love you when you get on my nerves because it's going to be filled with something else. We have an obligation to love. Um, a couple months ago, Bethany graduated from high school. Part of our senior, uh, as a senior, all the seniors there at Trinity have to do the senior project and then they, uh, they have to write it all, but then they have to give a speech. Um, what, what, uh, what was it called? The C thesis, the senior thesis. <laughs> And, uh, you know, she was looking at PTSD and how the church responds to mental health in, in, in the world, and specifically with, with our veterans. And many of you know I'm a chaplain at the VA hospital. And I have an opportunity to see a lot of people um, all the time coming through there that have been damaged. Uh, they are definitely damaged goods. They're our best and they're brightest when they leave and they end up having to go to war and they come back broken. And oftentimes we don't know what to do with that. We don't know how to help. We're getting better um, at the VA, hopefully, <laughs> that's kind of what we do. Um, it's getting better as we're treating PTSD and things like that, but the church has always kind of had trouble with that. Um, because, well, honestly, we would like to say, just trust Jesus and it's going to be okay. But I tell you what, that doesn't necessarily hold water. Yeah, you can trust Jesus. That doesn't mean everything's going to be okay. Remember what Jesus told his disciples? In this world, you will have what? Trouble, Trouble suffering, tribulation. Oh, wait a minute. These are his top 12 dudes. Why would they have? I mean, you can't get closer to Jesus than they were. Why would they have trouble? He said, it's going to happen. Stand by as the Navy in the Navy on a ship when there's rough seas and the ship has to come about. So all of a sudden the waves are coming uh, against the broad side of the ship. You'll hear an announcement that says, stand by for heavy rolls as the ship comes about. And, those, and then you stand by because the ship was really going to do this. And if you're not standing by, you're going to be part of the furniture pinging off the walls. So you don't want that or flying off the uh, side of the ship. That's bad. Just so you know. And that's what Jesus told his disciples. Stand by for heavy rolls because you trust me, you believe me, you love me, and they aren't going to like that. And so the troubles come, the trials come, and it, the formula, just trust Jesus, just have faith, and everything will be just hunky-dory. I don't know, there's probably no one in this room who that has been true of. Because we've all had stuff. We've all had tribulations. Uh, although James does say, when you have those, yes. say, go God. Because he must be doing something. He's building something. He's creating, he's, he's building patience and endurance. Long suffering produces the kind of character that God likes. Um, but in the senior thesis, Bethany was talking about this young man who I had a chance to encounter while I was there at the VA. I taught a class on spirituality to combat, what uh, they call it the combat track. These were um, uh, young men uh, and older men who had been in combat with PTSD that had not been treated. And we would go through, and it's usually it's a three-month program inpatient. So I had a class every week with them. <coughs> and... One day I was sharing about grace and forgiveness and uh, letting them know how much God's grace really is. Because I was raised Baptist. I heard, for by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one should boast. God's grace will save you. But then I realized I didn't know what grace was. You know, we can define it. God's grace is God's undeserved what? Love. Love is favor. His, it's unmerited. We don't deserve it. He gives it to us anyway. We can say that. But do we really know that? So this, uh, I had taught this class about this and just sort of sharing that God's grace extends beyond. And I've shared here to 
before several times about how God's mercy is Jesus picking us up out of the same stupid sinkhole that we fall in over and over and over again because we're all hard headed, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, or just just a bozo walking down the road. Oh, look, a hole. <laughs> oh, look, it's there again. I'm going to just jump in there no matter all the problems I had with that. So um, and it was just kind of a regular class. But this, there's a young man there and he was in tears at the end of it. And um, so he just kind of hung back a little bit. And so I was talking to him. And I said, whatever his name was, what's, what's going on? What's, what, what are the tears about? He said, Chaplain, I grew up in church. In fact, a church not far from here. A big church, a really big church. And I was a part of the youth group. And then uh, when I graduated high school, I got involved with a leadership team, the youth leadership. I was helping the, the kids and all like that, but I really felt like I needed to go into the military. So I enlisted into the army and I went through boot camp and I went to chapel every day or every week. And, uh, and then we had to deploy and I was in Afghanistan and we were in a combat zone. And I had to do some things, chaplain, that I'm not proud of. We, the rules of engagement, would not allow us to um, open fire in this particular town that we were in because there was women and children there, a lot of civilians there. And uh, the Iraqis were using them as, or the Taliban were using them as hum human shields. And so we couldn't fire, but they could fire on us. A couple of my buddies got shot and killed. I got shot in the leg. And then when they finally gave the order that we could shoot, I shot. My name wasn't true, and I hit. I hit a civilian, I hit a child. And then I eventually came back because I got shot, and so they couldn't keep me there, and they sent me back to Bethesda or wherever and rehab, and then ultimately was um, discharged, uh, never really dealing with this. And I went back home. And I tried to resume my life as normal. I tried chaplain. I tried like everything to do that. But I couldn't make the nightmare stop. I couldn't get this image of me shooting this kid out of my head. It wouldn't go away. The only thing that made it go away, chaplain, was alcohol. And so I started drinking just so I could fall asleep. And then I started drinking so I could stay asleep. And then I started drinking so I could forget. I still went to church. I still was active with the youth group. This was a part of me that nobody knew about. This was a secret. I went to one of my pastors because I couldn't carry this any longer. And I said, what am I supposed to do with this? And unfortunately, the pastor gave him, um, well, he gave him the only counsel he knew how to give. You need to get right and repent of all this sin. <laughs> and until you can do that, you probably shouldn't come here anymore. Wow, what? So, yeah. We, so, and, and I say this, all this guy, this kid, he needed a lot of things. But what he needed from his church and what he needed from other believers was this, love that God has given us. And it sometimes is really hard to love others when we don't understand or we don't get it or that's a little too close to where we are as far as off the path. And so I guess that would be the encouragement today. Uh, just taking this, this uh, passage of scripture and kind of focusing on that. There are the rules, there are rules. I mean, obviously, you, you got to follow the rules, some of the rules, speed limits and things like that. But in God's economy, it's about loving him and loving others. And that's enough. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, thank you that you are enough. And Lord, help us when you're not when we act like you're not, when we kind of get filled up with things that aren't you, help us to be able to clear some space so that we can let you flow in and through us. 
I thank you for this congregation, Lord, uh, a group of folks struggling on the journey together as we try to figure out how to live a life filled with grace and love and mercy and peace and joy, and then give it to others. Uh, bless us, Lord, as we move on through this day and this week, that you can be our first, middle, and last. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.